Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program, although as you can see, our fearless leader, County Board Chairman Mike Vandersteen, isn't with us today. In fact, Mike had some ankle surgery. He's resting comfortably at home, and if you get a chance or you know Chairman Mike Vandersteen, uh, please drop a note or, or uh, give him a phone call, because he may not be with us now for the next couple of months, in fact. But we are very pleased today to have Greg Schneller, our Highway Commissioner, with us. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Adam. I enjoy being here. Greg just mentioned to me it's been since 2006 since he started as Highway Commissioner. It's amazing how quickly the time goes. Right. We have met with a lot of challenges so far, but we're, we're weathering the storm. Weathering the storm. And speaking of storms, by the time you see this, things are already really clear. But uh, we had, what, 8 to 10 inches this weekend. And I thought the Highway Department just did a tremendous job. Uh, let's start there. Tell me a little bit about what it takes. I mean, when this area sees that kind of snowfall, uh, blizzard conditions, how do you respond to that? What's the game plan? Well, first we start in early November, we prepare all of our equipment, um, the wings, plows, uh, all of our trucks that are utilized for asphalt and gravel uh, installation over the summer months are transformed into winter uh, activities uh, and, and modes. And we also have our graders that have wings and, and such and V-plows so that we can open up for the bigger storms, uh, similar to this one. Uh, we did activate uh, just about every piece of equipment that we had uh, with our snow blowers and uh, Oshkosh trucks, which normally don't go until we get the big stuff. And usually we don't see the big stuff until January, February. Uh, when we have it, the ditches are all full and we get we get to drifting. So, in order to prepare for this, we spent a couple of days. We've heard about it coming, and nobody really knew where the eye was going to be. And we uh, uh, made some decisions as far as sending some guys home early to get some rest, and so we had enough people to go over the night. Our night shift is primarily only two guys um, for uh, eight hours, and another two guys for another eight hours after. So, as we got a second and third shift, but only consists of two people. Um, for this storm, we added a few more just to keep our main highways going and, and keep everybody moving along. So when it's just coming down like it was uh, Saturday night, and again, I know this is a tape delayed program, but certainly everyone's going to remember this snowfall for a while. When it's just coming down in buckets, winds blowing hard, do you try to stay after it while, it's, while that's happening or do you essentially hold off a little bit and say, let's let it come and get out there once rather than fight it the whole time. How does that work? We, uh, we will continually plow um, through the storm. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a challenge to shut down roads and say to people, hey, we're going to let you sit. We're not going to do that. It's, we're we're going to do our best to keep our equipment moving. But there is a, a safety fact that we have to look at as well, and that's to keep the motoring public safe besides our own people and our equipment. Um, when it's when visibility gets tough for us, it's it's tough to make sure that uh, there's nobody in front of you, and you're using a, a truck that weighs 72,000 pounds. So when it's loaded down with salt and a wing and a plow, you can do some real damage. And if you don't know what's in that snowbank, um, there's a potential of some danger. So we haven't had to. Uh, pull our plows yet. I remember a few years back uh, in a previous job where we did pull plows and it was a challenge. We had to shut down the uh, interstate and, and uh, put up barricades to not allow people to go back up there and it probably took us six hours to shut the interstate down and by that time the winds had died down. So it's, it's, it's a real challenge but we do continually plow. Um, the reason we do that is uh, we, we don't want to have the compaction similar to what you're seeing today. The, the snow really made a bond to the pavement and we're having some real challenges getting that off. Uh, that has uh, a lot to do with the temperatures that we're seeing now and the consistency of the snow when it came was real wet and moist and now we're stuck with it. So we're gonna, it's coming around, the sun's helping us now and that's our best, uh, our best friend right now and, and uh, we're going through a lot of salt though, so this is an expensive one. And, the, and when, let's, let's uh, complete that thought, you know, I, I've heard you say in the past or former highway commissioners say in the past, when you get three to five inches of snow to get that all cleaned up from beginning to end, you might be talking forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. I know, I know it depends on the wind conditions and everything else. Something like we experienced this weekend, what did we look at? I believe as I ran the numbers for Saturday and Sunday alone, um, as of yesterday, we had about $125,000 in it. Um, the storm or the, our, our cleanup will continue now and still will be continuing probably through Thursday. We're hoping that we can get it all cleaned up. We're expecting a little bit of snow overnight tonight and tomorrow. But uh, I would say by the time it's all said and done, we'll have close to $200,000 in this, in this storm alone. And we've kidded about this, but it's more cost effective for us when it snows during the week than over the weekends. 
Absolutely. We have some operators that worked on Sunday for 17 hours and that's completely overtime uh, the entire time. Um, so it's, uh, it, the overtime starts to rack up. Uh, you know, the truck gets the same rate no matter if it's going on Friday or Saturday or Monday or Tuesday. So um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the salt alone uh, goes for $60 a ton. Uh, that's what we're buying it for. Uh, when it's kind of strange to me where we can put asphalt down for $40 a ton and salt costs us $60 a ton, at the end of the season we have nothing to show for it. Yeah, yeah. Now, those who may have followed our budget process this year, of course the county board's been making real tough decisions about where they're going to provide limited resources, whether it's law enforcement, the highway department, health and human services. In our highway department, we've done some downsizing there. We've reduced the staff. Uh, where are we at right now with your table of organization? And again, back to the snow plowing on a regular shift, you know, how many folks are out there actually plowing snow in Sheboygan County? The, um, where, we're, where we currently stand today is we have 96 employees. At the end of December, we'll be down to 90. We'll be uh, laying off five empl uh, six employees. Um, and that's what we'll be budgeted for, or that's what we're budgeted for for 2011. Um, what it's going to do to our operation is, is we're going to continue to provide the service, but we're going to rely on the same people more often. Maybe making them or having them run longer, um, uh, shifting our, our services around, maybe our levels will be a little bit different, but you're not going to see a lot of change. Uh, we, one direction that we looked at when we were going through our budget cuts is that we feel that this is our main um, focus is to take care of winter and that's what people rely on us for to do so we didn't want to disrupt that apple cart if you will in order to make ends meet we are providing a service and a safety service so I know for a number of years now we've been we've had a hiring freeze in Sheboygan County we've been reducing some staff through attrition as they retire or, or take another job and if memory serves at one point we had about 120 employees at the, the highway department when I started in 06, we were at 118. 118. So a 25% reduction in our employees over the last four years. And I, I think it's important for people to understand that clearly snow removal and taking care of our highways, our infra infrastructure is a critically important task, critically important responsibility to Sheboygan County. But like all levels of government, we're feeling the pressures, we're hearing the demands to keep property taxes in check. Uh, we're seeing re reductions in revenue from the state level. And uh, we're also seeing demands for more services, whether it's health and human services, law enforcement, you name it. So I think Greg and his leadership has been absolutely critical to our success. And, and of course, we need to see how this next year or two unfolds. It will be at 90 is what we've budgeted. And um, of course, snow removal is a key responsibility. On any given day, for example, today, if we saw three to five inches of snow during the week, how many uh, individuals do you generally have out there doing snow removal? We uh, provide service to the Wisconsin Department of Transportation and plow their snow as well. So when we send out a full complement of, of our just our one-way trucks, the ones that are carrying the salt and, and doing the, the I, I would say the uh, primary plowing um, just to keep everything open, intersection salted, we send out 42 trucks. Um, at one point on Saturday or Sunday we had 60 employees in not counting our mechanics uh, and any of our supervisors that was just running the, the graders, which we would send out 12. We wouldn't do that with a three to five inch storm depending upon the wind and all that. There's different conditions that will dictate that. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're looking at 45 people that will be sent out on a three to five inch snowstorm. Okay, and, up, and 42 pieces of hardware, 42 trucks out there, one shape, size or kind out right. there involved with it. Yep, and then we had the graders, that's an additional 12, and we had six Oshkosh trucks out on, uh, on Sunday, and those are, like I said, depends upon the winter, but some of those haven't been used for four and five years, and we, they're like our insurance policy, if you will. Uh, they're old, but they get the job done. And then earlier you said, unless I misunderstood you, that the third shift, though, you only have a couple of folks out there. Right. So when, what time does the first shift start? Because I'm sure you want those roads clear before most people are heading to work. Well, our normal operation with the well running snow is 7 to 3.30. Um, at 3 o'clock, we have two individuals come in to take care of our second shift. They, they come in from 3 to 
uh, 10, yeah, 10 30, and then we have two others come in at 10 30 and they go until 7 o'clock in the morning. Their primary concern is I-43 and State Highway 23. The state pays for those individuals to be here to respond to their calls. That's not to say that we won't go off and take care of uh, uh, an emergency call someplace out in the county, but uh, that does take away from the service that we're providing to the state where there's more traffic. Um, so that's why when we get up in the morning and hit on Highway 23 or 57 or or one of the interstates, those roads are looking good because we've had some people doing nothing but f predominantly focusing on those. That's Whereas correct. during the day, your workforce is going out to all the county and town roads and yep. and uh, throughout the area. Our, uh, during a, if we would get that uh, three to five that you talked about earlier, if that would start, let's just say at um, maybe midnight the night before, we would bring our guys in, our first shift guys, then we'll be called upon maybe come in at three or three thirty, four 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then they'll plow throughout the day. So by the time the normal person would leave for work at seven or six or whatever, there's a pretty good chance that they're gonna have um, good sailing, if you will, or some salted highways uh, where the salt is starting to work. Um, typically, if that storm's gonna take the course and it's gonna continue throughout the whole day, we'll go until eight. Depending upon how bad it is, we might go until nine with those other individuals helping out on certain sections so we can get ahead of it so they can perform their services throughout the night when, when nobody else is giving them a hand. Um, so that's usually our uh, f four to eight is what we will run during a snowstorm if, if we have to. And then the night guys will take care of the, the hot spots, if you will. As we know, accidents always happen. And uh, obviously you want to really try to avoid, you know, hitting another vehicle or, or knocking over a mailbox. But I know just in the area of mailboxes that we both hear from time to time, just the weight of that snow coming off the plow can um, knock that mailbox right off. And I, and I noticed just the other day where one had been knocked off. If that happens, if someone has some damage like that, what should they do? Contact the highway commissioner, your assistant, how do you like that, to handle that? The, uh, the way the policy's always been, uh, if it's a, maybe an unwritten policy, um, if we cause the damage physically, if the wing of the, or the plow of the, of the uh, equipment will hit the mailbox where it's, you can see the physical damage, whether it's some orange paint or um, an area where it was definitely hit and dented, we will replace that mailbox and the post. Now, if it's caused by the snow, that's something that we really can't control, that would be the homeowner's responsibility to take care of that. We have fixed a few here and there because of arguments, because of yes, the plow hit it, no, the plow didn't, but uh, we would like the, the homeowner to be responsible for that because really it's something that we can't control. As you can imagine, if our truck's going 20 miles an hour and he's got a 13-foot uh, blade in front of him and a 12-foot wing on the side, there's a tremendous amount of snow and pressure coming off of that as he's going. So. And also along the lines of safety, I know you've said it before and I think it's always a good reminder, what's the distance that people should keep from these plows, whether they're heading down uh, 23 or, or on a town road? Minimum of 200 feet. You don't know, when we are plowing down a highway and if we have to come to a bridge, there's a lot of times that the, the bridge lays the same as what the plow is. And all of our bridges have a joint in them. And if there's not enough snow covering that, that plow has a tendency that it can fall in there and stop the truck dead in its tracks. So a lot of our guys will slow down, put a little pressure up on that blade so it's not falling in there. So if the person behind him is not paying attention or at least doesn't give him that, that 200 foot buffer, uh, when he slows that truck down, they're gonna be on him immediately. And obviously if he's out there, it's gonna be slippery because otherwise he wouldn't be there. So um, our guys are creating uh, whiteout conditions when it's windy and they're plowing, blah, 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 plowing and it's flying off the blade. So we don't want you to drive into that large cloud either. Stay behind the truck, stay at least 200 feet and give him his space because if he can't see you, or if you can't see him, he can't see you. And intersections I know sometimes can be a little confusing for folks because the plow will come up to the intersection. They might assume it's just going to go on through, but they may actually work those corners and push that snow back and be, and be backing up. Right. So you really got to be in your toes. As they're cleaning up and like I said, if you, if you can look into that truck and you can't see the operator in his mirror, then he can't see you either. So there's always that possibility. And when you're at the intersection, it, it's a good advice to turn down the radio so you can at least hear that backup alarm because sometimes the snow is covering their lenses in the back and you won't see that they're backing up, but you'll be able to hear it with the backup alarm. 
Now we're talking a lot about snow here, but it is the season and, and obviously it's a very important responsibility of the highway department and you've talked a little bit about um, your labor force and, and uh, the different schedules and, and the, the approach you take out there and you mentioned real briefly salt and the cost of salt and, and I know that's fluctuated tremendously and as you said at the end of the year the salt pile has gone and what did you get for it? But give our viewers a flavor for just how expensive salt is, what, what it costs county taxpayers as a whole to pay for the salt, how much we need every year, how much we go through, and, and where do you get it? We, uh, when we go through our salt, we have to order it in July already, and we go on a state bids. So all 72 counties plus the municipalities within those counties have an opportunity to go on a state bid where we can, um, obviously, when you buy that amount, you have, you have buying power where you get a little reduced price. Um, I believe the number is in the 100, and 100 plus thousand tons of salt that the, that the state of Wisconsin um, buys. So obviously if we all get in on that, we can, we can get in on their unit cost. Um, so we, what we do is we'll take our inventory at the end of the winter and uh, see what we have left. Um, based on five-year averages, we, we could uh, run about 12,000 tons a year, which basically comes down to about three-quarters of a million dollars in salt that we have to purchase. Um, we have salt sheds. We have to have the storage for that. It has to be inside uh, throughout the summer months. A lot of people try to keep it outside, but it leaches into the ground. Uh, it runs about $60 a ton, and uh, when you're going down the road and you're putting it down, you want to make, make sure you're utilizing it to its fullest extent. Um, these temperatures that we're seeing right now, sometimes the salt just doesn't work as, as effective. It won't work as effective. 15 degrees and below becomes a challenge where you have to add more to it. Um, we have been uh, taking advantage of some additional funding that we got from the state to uh, purchase tanks where we um, are starting to mix salt brine and that's injected at the spinner so that when the salt hits the road it's already activated it's wet and it's starting to melt so we don't get the bounce anymore where the mm -hmm. salt's bouncing off to the side of the road so mm -hmm. we've taken steps in order to reduce the use of our of our raw material the salt and started using the liquids to help uh, enhance it and your comment about the salt not working if it's 15 degrees or colder and I got to imagine from time to time folks are going to and from home or work and they're wondering why is this ice not yet off? What's taking so long? Well, if we're experiencing temperatures like we are now, four or five degrees, uh, it takes a little longer. You need some, need some sun and to get those temperatures up in the 20s is really the best. Sometimes it can work as a, as a disadvantage to you as well. As when we, some, if we're, if we're going to go out and salt in the morning, we pay real close attention to what the wind is going to do the rest of the day. If we um, go out and we're salting, we get the road all wet, and all of a sudden the wind picks up at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that snow is going to start to collect in the road, and the salt's not going to stay there long enough to melt it down. So now we've just created ice, and, and over the night it's going to turn to ice, and it's going to get extremely slippery that we're going to have to contend with throughout the night and for the next couple of days after. Someone experiences a real trouble spot. They, you know, leave it early in the morning, go through an intersection, or come around a curve and it's just glare ice or black ice, how should they, you know, and they want to be a good Samaritan and point that out sooner rather than later before somebody gets hurt or killed, do they contact the highway department, the sheriff's department, what's your advice there? Depending upon the timing, if it's during the week, um, Monday through Friday, we have people in the office from usually 6 a.m. until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Outside those hours, the best bet would be the sheriff's department. Inside those hours, they can call our, directly to our highway department and we'll get a hold of the people that take care of it. Very good, very good. I know we haven't even looked at these questions very much. Obviously, Greg knows this department and roles and responsibilities inside and out. Every year we talk about the seasons and that there's two predominant seasons. I know we've just talked a great deal about one of them, the winter season. What's the other? Construction. Uh, we all, uh, you, you, you see the uh, comics in the paper, you know, you know you're in Wisconsin when you see all the orange barrels up and down the highways and that's what we've been seeing over the last couple of years. And um, Unfortunately, we have such a short construction window, we want to try to compact as much into it as possible. So, uh, as you can imagine, things are starting earlier. You, this year, this, uh, in 2011, you'll probably see the orange barrels come out in March already for I-43. There's some bridges that need to be replaced. We have our own construction projects that will be coming up in April and in May. So, it, we're trying to get as much done in that short amount of time as we possibly can. And um, so, we're aggravating the people just constantly. It's either winter or it's construction. So it's not what we want to do. We just want to perform the best service that we possibly can. Sure. And you've got, you've got a tremendous crew of people there. 
as you mentioned, you know, the 90 employees working for you, you know, I certainly know you don't have just those who plow snow and just those that do construction. They're there year round and, and have a variety of skills. Um, talk, us, talk about the construction season a little bit and, and your workforce and, and how you utilize your workforce. What are the, some of the roles and responsibilities there? We, uh, we're pretty much a full service highway department. We uh, construct our own roads. We, we offer that service to our other local municipalities as well. We have an asphalt plant, a crushing operation. Um, uh, we have a grading crew, which is the grading crew does the uh, actual earthwork, um, cuts and fills, and then we have another crew that comes back and uh, adds the gravel and puts down the blacktop. Um, so it's when, when the construction's going on, our other crews are off working on a municipality job or another project that we have. Um, we have some backhoes, we have some earth moving equipment, um, Plus, we have our maintenance operation as well, where the mowing has to get done at the same time. Um, we're one of the few counties in the state that uh, takes care of as many townships as we do. There's 15 townships in Sheboygan County, and we take care of 11 of them. I mean, take care of them. I mean, that's uh, picking up the litter, filling the potholes, cutting the grass, plowing the snow, um, ditching, culvert replacement. So we're moving a lot and uh, taking care of a lot of stuff. Uh, we have 450 miles of, of highway department uh, uh, jurisdiction just county trunks. We have 170 miles of state road and we have 465 miles of township road that we take care of. A lot going on out there. Yep. And as we look for at 2011 ahead in the construction season that before we know it we'll be done plowing and back out there. What are some of the key projects you have come in our direction? We're going to be uh, first thing in spring we'll be going down to county trunk OK and EE for a roundabout project. Um, that, that intersection uh, from my knowledge has for the last 10 years been looking at a lot of accidents, and uh, uh, so that's what's our, our first project out of the out of the blocks. Um, from there, we'll be going over to County Trunk O to finish uh, from I-43 to Y. That's been a constant project from 2008 on now, and this is the last phase of it. And hopefully, we can get it completed and get it all taken care of. We got numerous uh, paving projects. The county board was gracious enough to give us some additional dollars this year to. Uh, uh, catch up on our road paving that's been put aside since the prices have been going up so high on, on the oil costs. And roundabouts, you, you said it, roundabouts, and I know, I know very well because every now and then you and I get a phone call about roundabouts. It seems like some people, <laughs> they either love them or hate them. Uh, and the folks that don't care for them, they, they generally tell us. We know there are a lot of good reasons for roundabouts and they're becoming more and more prevalent throughout not only the state of Wisconsin but the nation and they're very prevalent in, in some other countries. What is it about roundabouts that the Department of Transportation is is encouraging that they be put in now more frequently than ever before? Strictly safety. Um, less maintenance. The uh, When you look at a uh, traffic signal, um, a light setup, you know, those require almost as much real estate as what does a roundabout because you have to add in different lanes and put electrical boxes in so you have to have space for all that stuff. Um, the true reason behind a roundabout is that um, it reduces accidents and injury accidents by it's in upwards of 85 percent um, if not higher and, and the reason that is is because you're going into them at such a slow speed and when it's when you do have contact with another vehicle you're hitting it in the side where you're glancing off of your front fender it's not this t-bone type real aggressive accident. Um, some of the reduction in accidents at roundabouts are just because people don't want to use them so we're not seeing as much traffic you know they, they try to avoid them at every cost so um, so I guess they are still reducing accidents and, that, and that's what we're after we're after the safety for the people. Well as you said when you go in at the angle if you do hit someone you're not hitting head-on like you do through a stoplight or, or a stop sign. Personally the first couple of times I used a roundabout you know it does feel a little uncomfortable and you're looking to see who's coming and who's going but what I've come to really appreciate about them is you're never waiting for that doggone long stoplight. It seems like it really keeps the traffic moving. It's um, and, that, and that's really another uh, key point for them is that if you're um, you know if you're if you're in the circle you're the boss. So that's that's one of the things you got to learn right away. The guy in the, in the circle has the, has the right of way. Um, if you look back and you we watch people at certain intersections, they like to coast through them. Well, now you have the opportunity to do all the time in a roundabout. You're not going to ever get a call for not yield, failing to yield. Right. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, nice feature. How many roundabouts does Sheboygan County have now? Seven, soon to be eight. Seven, soon to be eight. Yep. And when we put in a roundabout, 
Um, you know, I think some people are under the impression, well, the county solely made that decision and the county taxpayer is solely paying for it. How is the process established? Why, when, when is it determined that a roundabout is the best approach? And then when that decision's made, how is it paid for? We um, typically will look at our accident history at the intersection and we'll ask for help from the DOT to indicate whether uh, what would be a good fix for this intersection. Not every intersection should be a roundabout, and, and I think we're all well aware of that. Um, so we'll start the process, we'll get an accident history on it, and the funding that's, that's associated with the roundabouts um, typically is federal funding, and the, the percentage of funding that you're going to get is based on the history of the accidents and the severity. Um, if there's uh, fatalities and uh, a lot of injury accidents, they establish a cost to all that. Um, the particular roundabout at uh, County Trunk OK and EE um, is a 90-10 funding. We're going to have 10% of it as our, as our responsibility only, and that's due to the severity of the accidents and the history and the, and the amount of accidents over the years. Um, the, inter the intersection of um, 40th and uh, Superior, that roundabout, that was solely funded by the county taxpayers. It was applied for uh, to get some funding, but it didn't, uh, it didn't meet their criteria. Um, it didn't have the accident history, if you will. That's a, a, a beautifully functioning um, roundabout with a couple of different legs off of it that uh, you don't see a lot with Wilga Street coming in at such an angle, but it's worked out well and I've, we've gotten a fair amount of compliments from it. Got some complaints as well, but some compliments too. But normally, how does the cost sharing work with a roundabout? If the Department of Transportation is involved with it and the accident rate's up there, what's the funding breakout normally? It would be 80-20 normally. 80-20 normally. Yep, and, okay. that's, and that's the, uh, the federal government would be, um, would be supplying, not the state government. Okay, very good. Well, we only have two minutes remaining and covered a lot of ground. And I know in the last four years, you know, as I mentioned at the onset here, tremendous challenges for anyone at any level of government. And uh, as our viewers know, real winds of change right now at the state level. Um, there's tremendous pressure to hold property taxes in check or reduce taxes at all levels. Yet at the same time, uh, work continues to need to get done. Demands for services in many areas continue to go up. And all 21 of our departments, including the highway department, need to be part of that solution and, and part of that process. As you look back at the last four years and, and look at the year or two or the next four years ahead, you know, what do you see as some of your key challenges or, or you know, what are you most proud of? And again, we only have about a minute remaining. Well, I'm most proud of that, that at this point we've reduced our service or our, our staff by 25% and we're still maintaining. We're, we're going to have to maybe prioritize some of our, our work schedule in the summer months and, and still focus all of our service towards the winter. I believe that that's, that's our strongest, that's the backbone of our highway department is our winter. Um, people rely on us to do that and that's what we're going to continue to do. Um, the biggest word for next year and the next couple of years is change and that's what we're all going to have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, like it or not, we can either embrace it or get rolled, rolled underneath it. Well, Greg, thanks for joining us today. No Excellent discussion of the good work your highway department's doing. I know you've got great staff. I know it's been a challenging period for all of us, uh, and certainly highway department employees who have left or a few will get laid off. But uh, I appreciate the good work that you're doing and your management team and everyone at the highway department. So thank, thank you, you for much. being here. And thank you for joining us. Next month, Aaron Brault, our new interim director of the Planning and Conservation Department will be here. So I look forward to introducing him to you. Very good person, has been working with our non-motorized program now for about five years and again, recently promoted to interim director. Until then, have a wonderful holiday season and drive safe.